Christ our treasure. There is none like him. Amen? Amen. Once again, it is a, a pleasure to, to be with you this morning here on this uh, fantastic Lord's Day. And what makes it fantastic is because it is the Lord's Day. Um, this morning, we are going to observe and remember our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his atoning sacrifice on our behalf. And we're going to do this by taking, uh, by partaking in the ordinance known as the Lord's Supper or communion. Before we do that, however, it is essential that we understand why we are observing this ordinance and how we are to observe it. In a moment, we will be turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and our text for today will be verses 17 through 32. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 through 32. And we'll be looking to these uh, verses for answers to those two important questions. Why are we observing it and how are we to observe it? Before we enter into our text, though, I believe it to be most important that I define the term ordinance. What is an ordinance and how many are there and why do Christians observe them? Well, Peter Gentry, a professor at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, addresses these questions in an article he wrote specifically for the Southern Baptist Convention regarding the commissioning of the 2002 Baptist Faith and Message, which is the most recent communication of the beliefs and practices for Southern Baptists. And we are a Southern Baptist-affiliated church here at Sardis Baptist Church. Dr. Gentry writes, An ordinance is an act commanded by the Lord Jesus in the Gospels and given by him for his followers to practice. An ordinance is an act passed on as tradition by Jesus' authorized agents, the apostles, in the letters to the churches. And an ordinance is an act practiced by the early church as recorded in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, better known to you and I as the book of Acts. Thus, using this definition, only baptism and the Lord's Supper can be considered ordinances of the Christian church. Now, why just these two? Well, because they demonstrate our acknowledgement that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ. Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. It's from Ephesians chapter 2. Baptism symbolizes our entering into a covenant relationship with God through Jesus Christ by faith. It is an outward confession of an inward truth that has been real, revealed to us by God through the ministering of his Bible. Think about baptism. We stand in death. We're buried. We go under. We're washed. And we're raised to new life. So baptism symbolizes our entering into this covenant relationship. It's the way that we express that we have come to faith in Jesus Christ, and we express that for all to see through baptism. Communion demonstrates that we are purposefully persevering and abiding, purposefully persevering and abiding in this relationship by acknowledging our need and desire for Christ to rule and reign in our lives. And remembering what Christ has done for us and what he has promised to us. 
I'm going to read that again. Communion demonstrates that we are purposely persevering and abiding in this relationship by acknowledging our need and desire for Christ to rule and reign in our lives and remembering what Christ has done for us and what he has promised to us. So with that brief introduction, uh, I am going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 17, and I will read down to verse 32. And I have the ESV translation of the scriptures. <clears throat> but in the following instructions, I do not commend you. This is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. <clears throat> because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For... In the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of our Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your instruction. We thank you that Christ, our Lord and Savior, is the fulfillment of the old covenant. We thank you for his sacrificial death, the perfect, holy sacrifice. Father, we thank you that we know this to be true. And we thank you for the indwelling of your Holy Spirit who guides us and teaches us and reproves us and corrects us and trains us in righteousness so that we may be equipped for every good work that you have set before us. We have nothing to fear. Father, you are great and mighty. We love you and we praise you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's look at the first half of verse 18 where Paul writes, for in the first place, you come together as a church. Why is the church in Corinth coming together? To celebrate the Lord's Supper. This is very important. The Lord's Supper is to be celebrated within and among the local body of believers. In the case of this letter, it's the church at Corinth. In our case, it's Sardis Baptist Church. Why is it to be celebrated within the church? Because the word communion means sharing or holding together. And we are communing with both God as well as with one another. You, individually, have been adopted as God's child through the atoning sacrifice of Christ. And you have been adopted along with all of us who have put our faith in Christ we are a family or a body. Communion is a family or body experience. And God is our heavenly father. This is one aspect of Christianity that is unique to other religions. It's one. There are many. 
And there are, this is one aspect that is very unique. Because we're not just pardoned criminals. But we have a personal relationship with God, our Heavenly Father, because we have become His sons and daughters through adoption. We were, by nature, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind, as Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3 tells us. But now, since we have believed in the name of Jesus Christ, he gave us the right to become children of God. That's John chapter 1, verse 12. Sometimes you will hear people say, oh, well, everybody's a child of God. That is not correct, according to the word of God. We're all created in the image of God. But you're children of one family or another. The family of wrath and sin, or you've been adopted, thanks be to Jesus Christ, into the family of God. And the church as a family requires us to treat fellow members as brothers and sisters, demonstrating family unity. Jesus himself instructed us in this. This is from Luke chapter 8. Then his, Jesus, then his mother and his brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. And Jesus is sitting in a house. He's teaching his family, his mother, Mary, and some of his siblings are out trying to get to him. And he makes a very interesting point. And the point is that Spiritual relationships trump everything else. And we see doctrine twisted all the time. And there's a denomination uh, within Christianity, the Catholic Church, that would exalt Mary as somebody to be worshipped. And this is just one of several verses that Jesus himself contradicts that teaching. The words of Christ contradict that teaching. It's so important that we know and seek truth in God's word. The church's family means there cannot be a separation between conversion, that is salvation, and church membership. There cannot be a separation. You can't come to know Christ and then not be part of his church. If you are saved, you will belong to a church that preaches and teaches the word of God, which is the Bible. God requires it. God has gifted you to be part of the body, working together under the head, which is Jesus Christ. He is the head of the body, and we work under him for his glory. If you are outside the body, you are not under the head. And Christians demonstrate their love for God and their faith in Christ by joining to and submitting themselves to his body, which is the church. Listen to the verses that affirm this truth. This is from Acts chapter 2. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Teaching, fellowship, communion, prayer. That's, this is the early church. From Hebrews chapter 10, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day, the day of Christ's return, draw near. And from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22, in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So then, now let's look at the second half of verse 18. I hear that there are divisions among you. How do divisions come about within a church? We've talked about this in the last few sermons that I've preached and through 2 Peter, through sinful desires, through lusts. And how have divisions come about specifically in the Corinthian church? They're not abiding in biblical doctrine, that is Bible-based teaching regarding communion or relating to God. They've started doing 
communion their own way, not according to Jesus' teaching, but the way that they feel like doing it. They therefore are in sin and have actually broken fellowship with God and with one another. And Paul is rebuking them, not out of judgment, but out of love. When I see somebody going the wrong way, doing something that is contrary to Scripture, the most unloving thing that I can do is look at that person and say, I hope somebody, God, I hope you bring up somebody to, to correct them, to, to help them. Uh, it's not going to be me, though. The most unloving thing I can do is not come alongside, not come out from in front like this, but come alongside as a fellow sinner who has been saved by grace and say, brother, sister, I think you might be missing something here, but don't take my word for it. Here's what God says. And this is what Paul is doing. Now, he's doing it sharply. He's trying to get their attention because what they're doing is severe and significant. But he's coming out in love. And the Lord's Supper is to be done in a very specific way. Why? Because through the communion ordinance, the gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed. Through communion, the gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed. The bread and the wine, or the cup, they speak to us. They remind us of the sufficient atoning sacrifice of Christ. They remind us, they renew our faith in Christ's love for us. The bread, this is my body, that's Christ's saving sacrifice. He came, he lived, he laid down his life, he raised it up again so that we might as well. And the cup, this is my blood, the new covenant, the new promise. We aren't justified by works, but by faith. Believe. Believe in what you know to be true. Believe and be blessed knowing that you are at peace with God. Thanks be to the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The elements are symbolic just as an engagement ring is symbolic. A man gives an engagement ring to a woman, not because that ring signifies he loves her more than he did 30 seconds before he gave it to her. It's a promise. He's saying, I love you. You're mine. I will cherish you and honor you and protect you and be with you as long as I live. And every time that woman looks down at her finger, she, that, that ring reminds her of that promise. The elements are symbolic of that. They're a reminder to us. Our action sharing the Lord's Supper together speaks to what unifies us as a church, the person of Jesus Christ and his perfect sacrifice on our behalf. We are all part of one body and responsible to him and responsible to one another for our individual good, for our collective good, and for his glory. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 5. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Our actions speak to those who are outside of the body of the church. When we take communion, these actions speak to those outside of the church because they are outside of the head of the body, which is Jesus Christ. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. It's Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. So Paul lays out his case against the Corinthian church in verses 20 through 22. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? Well, what shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Do you think that doing this, the way that you want to do it, even in part, do you think that's glorifying to God? Do you think that's good? It is not. I will not commend you. 
And so Satan, we have to remember, seeks to divide members of the body from the head. And how does he attempt to do that? Through lies and distortions of biblical doctrine and gospel truth. This is who he is and what he's done. And he's done it from the very beginning. Go back to the Garden of Eden. First question ever asked in Scripture is asked by Satan. Did God actually say? Questioning God's word. And Satan will do that today. Question, did God actually say that? You won't surely die. He questions God's promises. For God knows that when you eat, you will be like God. Satan questions, questions God's character and motives and our need to obey him. There's this temptation. You don't have to do that. You don't have to abide. There's an easier way. There's a better way. There's a more interesting way. And what verses 20 through 22 demonstrate to us is how the church in Corinth had wandered into divisions by completely discarding Jesus' instruction on how to worship him. Their carrying out of the Lord's Supper was complete lawlessness, which was fed by their pride and selfish desire to be recognized, which led to disorder, chaos, and disharmony. And worse than that, Scripture tells us that lawlessness is sin, and sin has consequences, as we will see in just a few short verses. But moving along to verses 23 through 26, Paul starts off in verse 23, for I have, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. Paul is directing the Corinthians toward biblical doctrine and gospel truth. This is what Jesus did. This is what Jesus said. This is what Jesus said we are to do until he comes again. And where's Paul getting this from? Well, from the Lord. Maybe through direct revelation but certainly through the other apostles. Maybe both. He doesn't make it clear. But either way, what he teaches here exactly matches what the Gospels teach regarding Jesus' instruction of communion. And we find that in three places. We find that in the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 26, Mark, <clears throat> chapter 14, and Luke, chapter 22. And I'm just going to turn to Luke, chapter 22, and read you two verses these are from the, the lips of Jesus, from the night of the Last Supper. And he, Jesus, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. What we find in these verses is that Jesus has rewritten the script, or the scriptures, so to speak. Because what were the apostles, soon to be apostles, to make of this? Because up until this point right here, they were celebrating the Passover. And we just have to go back a couple verses in Luke chapter 22, verses 7 and 8 to understand that. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. Well, what was the Passover? And what did it represent? The Passover happened one time in history, but the Jews were commanded to observe it every year. And we see this in Exodus 12. And it involved sacrificing a male lamb without blemish, as best the eye could tell, the most perfect lamb that you had, that was male. And the blood of that lamb was to be spread on the doorposts of each home. By the sign, the angel of death would pass over such a house. Well, why blood? Because life is in the blood. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, Leviticus 17, 11. Why blood? Forgiveness which leads to eternal life and peace with God. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That's Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. And they were to eat the Passover lamb with unleavened bread. 
Why unleavened bread? Well, leaven is yeast, and it causes dough to rise. And in the Bible, leaven is almost always, not exclusively, but almost always symbolic of sin. And like leaven that permeates the whole lump of dough, sin will spread in a person, a church, or a nation, eventually overwhelming and bringing its participants into bondage and eventually to death. And what we see occurring in this last Passover is Jesus changing what God had commanded and instituted. So what does this indicate to us about the authority of Jesus? It indicates that he is God. Because only God could change the rules and regulations regarding his own covenant. This had never been done before. How is the Lord's Supper related to the Passover? Or another similar question you could ask is, how is the new covenant related to the old covenant? I picked out a couple of uh, examples as I read the scriptures. The old covenant, the very existence of the people of God in the Old Testament, the Jewish people, was grounded in the work of deliverance that God brought about at the Exodus. God brought his chosen people, Israel, out of Egypt. The New Covenant. The very existence of the people of God in the New Testament, the church, is grounded in the work of Jesus Christ. Through Christ, God has delivered and is delivering the church out of the world. Old Covenant. Judgment was visited on the land of Egypt for their rebellion against God and his commands and the mistreatment of Israel, God's chosen people. New Covenant. Judgment is and will be visited on the people of the world for their rebellion against God and his commands and the mistreatment of the church, God's chosen people. Old Covenant. God provided a means of salvation for his people Israel, but also for any foreigner, including any Egyptian, who by faith followed the Passover command. New covenant. God has provided and will provide a means of salvation for any and all who repent of their sins and turn to God by faith. God's true church is made up of an eclectic. Eclectic means broad and diverse. An eclectic group of people who all have one thing in common. We are all forgiven sinners. Old covenant. An unblemished male lamb would be slaughtered as an atoning sacrifice. New covenant, the lamb of God, Jesus Christ, the only and completely unblemished sacrifice that ever was, was slaughtered as the final atoning sacrifice. Old covenant, the blood of the lamb would be put on the door frames of the houses of God's people so that the angel of death would pass over. New covenant. The blood of Christ covers those who have believed, so that although we will physically die, we will not also spiritually die when judgment for all comes. Old Covenant, the homes where the Lamb's blood was visible would be spared the plague of the death of the firstborn son. In a very tangible sense, the Lamb died instead of the firstborn son of the household. New Covenant, in and through Christ, the Lamb of God, we are adopted into God's family and given all the rights and privileges of firstborn sons. And to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. It's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23. Jesus died the death we deserved. Old covenant. Bet you never thought I'd be able to extract all these things out of, uh, right? When, when is this guy going to end? Old Covenant, this is the last one. Old Covenant, the Passover meal was to be a continual reminder of the great salvation that God brought to Israel through a great act of judgment. New Covenant, the Lord's Supper is to be con a continual reminder of the great salvation that God brought to his church through a great act of grace, undeserved merit. That's what grace is, undeserved merit. Through a great act of grace and sacrificial giving, love. When the Israelites ate the Passover, they were acknowledging an event 
of salvation that had happened in the physical sense. When the church eats the Lord's Supper, we are acknowledging an event of salvation that has happened in the spiritual sense. So what we see Jesus doing here is not to change God's covenant. Jesus is explaining that he is the fulfillment of the old covenant. And his life, upcoming death, and resurrection will put an end to the sacrificial system that the Jews lived under. Jesus is ushering in the new covenant. Peter Gentry, in the same article I referenced earlier, states, God had made a covenant with his people at Mount Sinai when he brought them out of Egypt. A relationship of love, loyalty, and trust had been established. He would be their God, and they would be his people. This covenant relationship, initiated by sacrifice, had been broken by the people. They had not been faithful to the agreement. They had not followed God's standards for the relationship. The death of Jesus initiates a new covenant by a better sacrifice, one that does not need to be repeated. The new covenant is a better agreement because now, not only God, but also his people will be able to keep the agreement because of the Holy Spirit in and through us. End quote. Why? Because God, through Jesus' perfect sacrifice, will now indwell the church so that they are capable of faithfully obeying him. And it is in the Old Testament that God actually makes this promise known. Jeremiah, chapter 31, starting in verse 31. Listen to these words. This is, the nation of Israel in complete and total bondage. They've been carried away by the Babylonian Empire. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. That verse in Jeremiah, the Old Testament, is expressly representing, foreshadowing the coming of not only Christ, but the Holy Spirit of Christ to indwell us. And this is just one of many instances throughout the Old Testament that God foreshadows the coming of Jesus Christ as Savior and the ministry, the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Well, now then, let's move along through our text in, in 1 Corinthians, verses 27 through 32. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Hey, these are some tough verses. It's important for us to realize what Paul is doing here. He is fencing off the table. He's putting a guard around the communion table. And there's only one, this one little narrow gate by which people can enter to partake in communion. And why is he doing it? Out of love and for their good. He's telling the Corinthians, you can't just show up and engage in communion with God on your terms, the way that you see fit. And what does the scripture tell us? It's telling us the following. The Corinthian church was taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. How so? 
they knew the commands that had been handed down by Jesus. Paul had showed us, hey, I handed down to you what I received. I've already taught you about this. I told you. And they knew those commands, but they were not doing what they knew to be true. This is the definition of sin. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. That's James chapter 4, verse 17. The blessing always comes from the knowing and doing of God's word. And discipline always comes from the knowing and disobeying of God's word. Why? Because we're profaning the name of Christ. Listen to how the author of Hebrews puts it in chapter 10, starting in verse 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there, is, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. What that means is anybody who tries to carry out the law and is found guilty of violating the law in any sense, all it takes is two or three witnesses to condemn that person. And some violations of the Old Testament law included being put to death. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Not talking about sin that we aren't aware of. <clears throat> Talking about knowing God's word and doing something completely different. The members of the Corinthian church were not examining themselves or their hearts. They were not judging the outward actions of their hearts truly. They were not recognizing their sin, confessing their sin, and repenting of their sin before seeking to commune with a holy, righteous, and forgiving God. That's why Jesus sacrificed. So that, because, remember what I said, it's purposefully persevering in a body. Not perfectly. We will sin. And when we do, and when we're convicted of that, we must turn, we must confess to God what he already knows, and repent, which means turn back towards. This is why Jesus died. So that, we could do that and not have to worry about trying to make ourselves righteous, which we could never do. They were just mindly engaging in an activity, communion, without contemplating the significance of what communion represents and who instituted it. Because of that, because they were knowingly profaning the blood of the covenant and outraging the spirit of grace, God was disciplining them up to and including death. For the wages of sin is death, and the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans chapter 6. So then let us learn from the mistakes of the Corinthians and not suffer the same discipline that they did. Let us examine ourselves before we take of the bread and the cup, which represents Christ's broken body and shed blood on our behalf. Now, how can we be assured we are taking the elements in a worthy manner? I'm going to lay this out for you. How can we be assured that we are taking the elements in a worthy manner? One, have you repented of your sins and accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If you have not done that, you should not engage in communion. Number two, have you been publicly baptized to signify to the church and to the world that you have entered into this covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. Baptized. Baptized into Christ's death. Fully immersed. Here's the other thing I would say to you. That you need to be aware of and be cautious of. If you had a false salvation experience, maybe you thought at the age of eight you came to know Christ as Lord and Savior, and then you were baptized. 
But then at the age of 25, you realize, you know what? I, I have not, that was wrong. And at 25, you realize you've been saved. But you weren't baptized because you said, I was baptized when I was eight. No, you weren't baptized when you were eight. All you did was get wet. <laughs> Baptism follows coming to Christ. It is an outward sign. Number three, are you an active member of this local church or another church that preaches and teaches the authority of the Bible? Are you regularly communing with other believers, serving, seeking to be served? Have you joined yourself to Christ through his body? And finally, number four, is your conscience clean or are you living in unconfessed and unrepented sin? Meaning, do you know you're doing something you should not be doing? For example, you might say to yourself, well, I've cheated on my taxes the last three years, and my intention is to cheat on my taxes again this year because our government is evil. <laughs> That's sin. You give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Or you might say, I've got a big test coming up. I don't think I'm going to do real well. I'm going to cheat. That's sin. If you are doing something you know is wrong and remaining in that and not confessing that and turning to God and asking him to help you, if you are holding on to something that you know is contrary to God's word, I would encourage you, don't engage in communion. And I'm not telling you this out of judgment. I'm here to warn you. I'm here to help you. I'm here to guide you. Trust me, brothers and sisters. I will be, and the Lord will be well pleased, I will be much encouraged if you recognize one of these four things. Hmm. I don't have a right relationship with God right now. And you pass by this. And then come see me. Come see me in private. Talk to me. Email me, call me, and I'll help you. I'll come alongside of you, and we'll figure this out. So that next time we do communion, you're doing it in a way that is good for you, good for the body, and glorifying to God. So what I'm going to do is we are going to, uh, we're going to pray, and then we're going to share communion together. And let me help you how to, I'm going to help you to visualize how this will work. This is the first time that I've led communion here, so you maybe have had an experience in the past that's, that's different than the experience that, that I've had. This is the, I don't think it's the first time, but I haven't done a lot in terms of leading communion. So I'm going to lay it right out there so we're all on the same page. And we're, we're using the elements, I think, that are unique to, to most of us in the day and age of COVID. Okay, I'm going to open us in prayer, but I'm not going to close us you will each close silently in prayer. You come before the Lord. Rejoice in Him. If there's anything that's on your heart and the Holy Spirit convict you of, confess of that. Ask God to help you. So I'm going to open in prayer, and then all of a sudden my voice is just kind of going to drift off, drift off, and you're not going to hear anything for a while. It's going to be this awkward silence. For It'll probably seem like 10 minutes. It's probably only going to be a minute. Take your time, relish that, enjoy it, go before the Lord. Then you'll hear my voice again. And we'll all stand together, and I will read the verse, uh, a verse regarding the body and the bread, and we'll take the bread together. And so what you can do right now is, if you uh, anticipate you're going to take communion, okay, there is, there's two layers to this. The top layer, there's a very, you almost can't see it. It's clear. You want to peel that back. And when you do, there's this, you'll see this circle. Okay? That's the bread. Don't take it now. You can peel back if you want to now. Okay? Probably be a good idea if you intend to take communion. We're going to, that's the bread. That's the body. Once we take that, I'll then read a verse regarding the cup and the blood. And we will all then peel back the second layer together. Don't drink yet. You can peel it back. Once you're done peeling it back, 
look at me. Because once I have everybody's attention, I know everybody's looking at me, then I, know, then I can say, okay, and I'll read the verse regarding the blood, and we can take the cup, excuse me, when we can take communion together. Um, and just watch me for that cue. If you are going to bypass, there is nothing shameful in bypassing communion. If you realize this morning, one of those four things that I laid out for you, you have doubts about. My encouragement to you is it's okay. Don't engage. But then don't leave and not come talk to me. I, I want to be here to help you and to serve you. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we are, are grateful. We are grateful that we are able to commune with you in and through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, we come before you this morning. We are about to commune with you. Father, help us. We know we are not perfect. We know we are far, so far from perfect. Father, but we are going to come to you right now. And we're going to take a moment to share our hearts with you. Father, hear us. Help us. stand. And when Jesus had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all on this Lord's Day. God bless you.